Well, good morning and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church. Thank you so much for joining us this day as we gather together to worship. And thank you also for helping to uh, keep us all safe as we uh, continue to wear masks whenever we are inside in these days. We invite you to come on over to the Fellowship Hall immediately following our worship service where we have some refreshments and also have an opportunity to greet you a little less formally. Uh, looking ahead on the calendar, next week, uh, next weekend, is when uh, we move off of daylight savings, which means you get an extra night's or extra hour's sleep at night, but that also means that we will be starting our worship service a little bit uh, later on uh, your schedule. So two, please do uh, make the adjustments to your uh, clock and join us next week at our regular time at 1030 like to invite uh, up on to the chancel of uh, Bill Conjelton, who is the uh, chairperson of our pastor nominating committee. Okay. Uh, last week, we told you that uh, we have found someone uh, that we recommend to uh, candidate for our pastor. And uh, I was a little bit coy about the details uh, to give him time to uh, tell his congregation that he will be leaving. He's a pastor of not one, but two churches in the uh, eastern part of LA. Um, he's got a bigger church and then a smaller church that he was uh, important in starting. So for the past three years, he's been giving two sermons, not one, and running two services. Uh, his name is uh, Reverend Dr. Eric Daly, and uh, he, he has a PhD from uh, Fuller, and he's been at uh, his current location for eight years, and he, obviously he was in the, uh, he, he was ordained in 2005, and he's been in the business for since then. He's 42. He has a wife and a child. His wife is also a pastor in the Pasadena area. And um, so the game plan here, and we were a little bit reticent to reveal all that so that he had time to, to tell his congregation that he's leaving and he didn't hear about it by tweeting or from some other location. So. Uh, the cat's out of the bag, and, and uh, we we're, uh, really feel good about it. We, the, we think that God has been with us in uh, searching for him, and uh, we like him, and I think that he likes us, so we're, we're optimistic. He will candidate on November 21st. That's, in other words, he, he will conduct the service on November 21st, and then the congregation will vote afterwards to accept him or not. There'll be a ballot and it says yes or no. Uh, we, we hope and pray that everyone will say yes, um, and then there'll be a reception after that. But he won't start here until uh, after Christmas. No, it's January 3rd, uh, January 9th, will be his, uh, the first time that he will actually be here uh, to, to run the service from the get-go. So that's roughly the schedule, and um, you'll be receiving a letter that has his name and whatever details we can put together. And we're asking everybody to wear, start wearing your name tags so that he can recognize people. And we also have some new people, so uh, we're anxious that they also become, uh, get to know everybody here. <clears throat> So I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you the members of the Pastor Nominating Committee. Uh, we've been meeting now for the past eight months, every Tuesday, uh, and, uh, uh, and it's taken that long to actually put everything together. Uh, but we think that God has been guiding us throughout this whole process, and we feel very good. Our senior member is Marion Lovelace, age 94. And I, I don't, I guess, uh, I don't know if she's in the room here, um, but she's been our recording secretary. She took the minutes the whole time, and so we have a good record of everything we did, and if anybody wants to read, uh, you can find out how we've been spending our time for the last eight months. Um, 
She's also uh, a deacon, and uh, she's also the recording secretary there. So uh, our next in age, actually, surprisingly enough, is Eric Stratton. Oh. I mean, I mean, Glenn. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. Um, can you not hear me? Okay, all right. Um, first met Glenn when he and my son uh, were in the same when the youth group here, and uh, Sheshan and I were the uh, the faculty, the parent coordinators for a year or so. So it's been fun to watch him grow up and retire. He just retired from a career in the. Uh, uh, L.A. County Fire Department, but uh, he was our vice chair. He was very helpful in checking uh, uh, references for some of the people that we were uh, looking at. Uh, our third, third and fourth age-wise, uh, de in descending order, uh, we were blessed to have two new people uh, come in the past two or three years uh, Masi uh, La Jalilian and uh, Shabnam uh, Perkati. yeah. Um, Masi has been, uh, was a deacon for three years, and for the past year or two, she's been holding a full time job and also going to school full time. One of the things that happens when you come in from a foreign country. Uh, you have to take courses you've already taken before to get um, to get Americanized, if you will. So she just got her degree going full time and working full time. Uh, at the same time, she was working on the, uh, uh, the the PNC and very helpful in in doing that. Uh, Shabnam can't be here today because she's working. Same deal, you know, when you're new to the country, while well, you wind up getting the, the off hours, and uh, so Shabnam is not here, but they're both big help in, in evaluating the, uh, uh, the resumes that we receive. But our youngest member is also our spark plug and probably our most valuable player. Uh, Allison Schultz uh, was the corresponding secretary, and she had the, uh, the job of receiving all these uh, um, uh, resumes, recording them, making sure they got distributed to the people in the PNC, uh, recording our responses to it. Uh, she's been the spark plug in this whole thing, and she's really the one that made it work. Her energy is, is a major plus, and she does not put off till tomorrow what she can do yesterday. Um, she ran our Zoom meetings, and uh, she her computer skills are really terrific in terms of putting everything together. So all those people, uh, I'd like you to just give them a hand for the time that they put in and all the things they did. So. <laughs> now, it's not over yet. We still, again, we still have to have a candidate meeting. Uh, the, the congregation will have to be here and uh, and vote on that. That meeting will, uh, the, Eric will conduct the meeting and then we will excuse him and the, and the congregation will vote yes or no and that meeting will be run by someone from the Presbytery. But assuming that that goes well, uh, we'll be putting out some written information to follow up with this and uh, we'll have re like to have a reception after that candidate meeting. And then uh, we'll go through Christmas with the same team that we have. And then on January 9th, well, Eric will be here uh, in the pulpit. So again, God's help, we have managed to muddle through this process. Uh, we feel very good about what we've come up with. Uh, the members of the PNC have been terrific as it's been a good team and a joy to work with them. So I hope that uh, you'll all be here. Start wearing your name tags, and everybody plan to be here for the congregational meeting on November 21st. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell everybody you can find. Thank you. Good catch. Thank you, Bill. Let us worship God. 
Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. For the Lord is a gracious God, whose mercy is everlasting, and whose faithfulness endures to all generations. Will you pray with me? God of mercy, have mercy on us. God of wisdom, illumine our minds. God of light, shine into our hearts. Eternal goodness, may your goodness grow in us. God of power, be our refuge and strength, now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and together sing our gathering song. Relationships are things that are critical to each of us. Relationships with our families, with those people who live close by, with those with whom we work, with those in our communities. And the purpose of discipleship is really about how to build great relationships. Discipleship is about more than just right belief. Right belief is important. But frankly, one can believe the right things and be pretty terrible at building your relationships. The purpose of discipleship is about something more than wholehearted determination. It is instead the purpose of discipleship, of following Jesus, is to build loving relationships. That's what Paul was talking about when he wrote in 1 Corinthians, Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three and the greatest of these is love. It's why Jesus, when he asked, what is the summary of the law, said to love God and love neighbor. He hasn't said, depends on what you believe. He says to love God and love neighbor. So love is how following Jesus tells us how to build great relationships. 
So given that, what are the things that we do? What are the markers for building those type of great and loving relationships? James, the brother of Jesus, wrote a letter to the early Christians to help give some guidelines, some keys for building those great relationships. And he wrote these words in the third chapter of his letter, beginning with the 13th verse. I invite you to follow along as we read from James chapter 3, 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, this morning as we take a look again at these ancient words, it is our prayer that we will hear your voice speaking to us this day. Touch, renew, and refresh us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. This morning I'd like to take a look at this passage, particularly in that second to the last verse, for what are seven keys for building great relationships, relationships based on love. And the first key that James highlights is to build a great relationship, we start with ourselves. And it says, we are going to be a person of godly integrity. Specifically, what James says in verse 17 is, the wisdom from above is first of all pure. Now, pure has several different connotations. The first is, pure is referring to integrity. It's using pure in the same sense that the old ivory commercial said their soap was 99 and 100 percent uh, 99 and 99, 100% pure. <laughs> it wasn't making a moral judgment about it. It was saying there's an integrity, a consistency, a cogency. What you see in one situation will be what you see in another. And it says here, first, in order to build great relationships, we need to be persons with integrity. Because quite frankly, unless we are at home with ourselves, it's impossible to be present with others. The writer of Proverbs put this, puts it this way. In Proverbs 10, 9, he says, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever follows perverse ways will be found out. So the beginning point is that I will be a person of consistency in each of the realms of my relationships, in my private life and in my public life, in my work life and in my home life, in my personal life and in my professional life. When you see me, you will see me. But the, the Greek word that he uses here also has another connotation. It's pronounced hagnos. And what it means is that the values that will shape that commitment to integrity are values that reflect the character of God. I will take what God treasures the values that God declares, the principles that God enunciates and offers to us as the guiding thing around which to build that life of integrity. So how do we know that that is something that we are making progress with, that we are, are beginning to meet that first uh, element, that first key? And I would say a good question to ask ourselves is, is what I am doing and how I am doing it, something that will bring honor to Jesus. When persons know that I am a Christian, will what I am doing and how I am doing it bring honor to Christ through their eyes? The first key is to be a person of godly integrity. The second key, James highlights, is to try to find synergistic solutions. 
in verse 17, we continue, the wisdom from above is peaceable. What he's talking about here is how you handle and understand the context when there is a disagreement going on. Is the disagreement something that is a battle of power in which we need to win and come out on top? Or is it something else? We don't see differences as a contest of power, but instead, as a disciple of Christ, an opportunity for God to lead. In Proverbs 23, it reminds us, any fool can start arguments. The wise thing is to stay out of the argument. So how do we do that? The first thing is the faithful assume that God is present, that God is at work here, and that what we know about God because of Jesus is God values everyone. And because of that, we will seek to find God at work. What we will understand is God is always going to be larger than our experience, our hopes, our dreams, and our concerns. And what, because God is going to be larger than that, we are going to see the opportunities for our seeing a different perspective as an opportunity to discover a God who is larger than we expected. Now, I said synergistic solutions. And the reason I picked out that word rather than compromise, we hear a lot about compromise this day, is when people hear the word compromise, they think it's about giving up something. And what I'm suggesting here is something different, a different context. It is, how can I be responsive and responsible to what the other person is indicating they want, need, and have to have that can be met at the same time of my searching for the same thing? We are looking for God to be at work here. And God will be working in surprising and unexpected ways. But what that also means is the relationship is not threatened simply because there is a disagreement. It is something that can work through and even build off of that event. Be a person of godly integrity and try to find synergistic solutions. But how do we begin to do that? The third thing is to consider others' perspectives to uh, discover that they see the world differently than ours. Again, in the 17th verse, we read, the wisdom from above is considerate. Considerate means we are open to consider other options other than our own. Proverbs 13, 15, again, or 12, 15, reminds us, a fool thinks he needs no advice. A wise person listens others and so our first thing is to at least be able to understand what the other's perspective is again how can we test that we have really got a handle on it i mean because we can almost assume oh i understand what they're saying i know what their agenda is and oftentimes that's colored by our own perspective so what's a test that we can use a test that i try to do is say to the other person I think I understand what you're trying to communicate, and it is this. And ask them, have I articulated it to their satisfaction? If they say, no, you haven't got it yet, then I know I haven't got it yet. <laughs> it is being, taking the initiative to try to understand the other person's perspective. But why is that important? The other meaning of this term that's translated here, considerate, is gentle. Gentle is, uh, the the word, (laughs) if you were to read it in the New uh, Revised Standard Version, rather than the New International Version that we did, is uh, the wisdom from above is gentle. Now, gentle means something more than just soft. What gentle means is strength is exercised, understanding how it impacts others. 
A person can be very strong, very powerful, but they use that power gently when they are aware of how it impacts others. And understanding their perspective is the beginning, but it's also understanding that this is not just a simple exercise of power. It is how the power is utilized to touch others. Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Philippians. In Philippians 4.4 4, he says, Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Use your power in ways that are aware of how it impacts others. We do that because the Lord is near. So, a person of bodily integrity, a person seeking synergistic solutions, I'm willing to consider other person's perspectives. The fourth one, James highlights, is being willing to yield. In verse 17, the wisdom from above is willing to yield. Now again, different translations sort of uh, highlight different aspects of the original Greek term. If you were to look in different versions of the Bible, this verse is translated different ways. If you were to read the New International Version that we did for its beginning, it says submissive. The Revised Standard said open to reason. The New Revised Standard, willing to yield. The Living Bible says allows discussion. So what is this trying to get? What is it aiming with all these different ramifications? What it's saying is the relationship is not establishing a pecking order of authority, but a community in which all can be the potential spokesperson for God. And the thing is, that can happen in very surprising, unexpected ways. There's a a humorous story that's found in the 22nd chapter of Numbers. A man of God named Balaam is uh, summoned to go and uh, to do what God's will is. And he gets on his donkey, and as he's riding there, the donkey keeps seeing in front of him an angel sent by the Lord that is a a, a potential life-threatening threat. And so what will happen is the donkey sees this, but Balaam doesn't see it, and he goes off to the side or walks off the road. And Balaam is beating the donkey, trying to get it to go to where he thinks. Eventually, it gets to be a narrow place in the road where there is, a, there is a cliff or a wall on each side, and the donkey, in seeking to avoid the danger, scrapes Balaam's leg on the uh, side of the walls, and Balaam is beating the donkey, trying to get him back to where he thinks he's supposed to be going. At this point, the donkey talks to uh, Balaam and says, didn't you see the angel of death there? And what this story of Balaam's ass is really telling us is sometimes God even uses people that we think are asses to communicate with us. A willingness to be surprised that maybe God's spokesperson is the person we think is an ass. The willingness to yield is the willingness to be surprised. Fifth, in order for the relationship really to thrive, it needs to focus more on the future than on the past. The specific words in verse 17 are, the wisdom from above is full of mercy and good fruit. You see, a relationship that is based on the past has nowhere to go. Instead of just making a relationship that giving people what they deserve because of past content, the primary strategy is how can we make a future possible? That's really what the essence of mercy is about, is seeing how we make our judgments so they can make a different future possible. And what that means is we're not going to throw back at a person the mistakes that they have made. Indeed, in Proverbs 17.9, we're reminded, love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them even parts the best of friends. Instead, there may have been mistakes, but the way to talk about them is how we build for the future. And with that, even when mistakes have been made, the relationship still can thrive. 
So, godly integrity, trying to find synergistic solutions, considering others' perspectives, being willing to yield, focusing more on the future than on the past. The sixth one is don't prejudge others. The specific words in verse 17 are, the wisdom from above is impartial. All of us have first initial judgments about others. Part of that's what experience is. It gives us a backlog to be able to interpret or make expectations of our present situation. But we can make it so that that expectation becomes something that defines what's possible now. Instead, we are to acknowledge, that's my first judgment, but I'm willing to be corrected. I'm willing for that not to be my last judgment. As James says a little earlier in his letter, in chapter 2, verse 1, my brothers and sisters, as believers in our gracious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. It is to let us be corrected, even though we will always have a first judgment. And finally, in order to have a great relationship, a relationship based upon love, it is necessary that we be authentic. Verse 17 says, the wisdom from above is sincere. And that authenticity has to do with both our strengths and our limitations. If we are not realistic and authentic about our strengths, quite frankly, we will never realize our potential or what we can bring to the relationship. Unless we are realistic about our limitations and maybe even our weaknesses, we'll never think we need to be blessed. And unless we are transparent about that, only a superficial alliance will be possible limited by our common interests. You may recognize the name uh, Dave Thomas. He was the, the founder of Wednesdays, Wendy's. And he tells this about uh, in an interview that he had. He said, honesty is the number one ingredient for success. I learned this by trial and error. I was born out of wedlock in New Jersey in 1932. A Michigan couple adopted me after I was born. My adoptive mother died when I was five, but I had the good fortune that I had wonderful adoptive grandmother who raised me. I did not discover that I was adopted for many years, and I have to admit, this made me angry and resentful for some time. Yet after I learned the truth, I didn't always share it with others. One day at a Wendy's manager meeting, he buttonholed me and said, Dave, when you gave your speech today, you left out the part of being adopted. Why did you do that? I've always related to that because I was adopted myself. The comment hit home. And from that point on, I made it a practice to be fully honest and proud about my past. Our authenticity permits authenticity from others. And quite frankly, we will not expect of others what we are unwilling to do ourselves. So to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus is to make great relationships with others, with God and with others. That means we'll be persons of godly integrity who try to find peaceful solutions who consider others' perspectives and are even willing to yield. We will focus more on the future than we do on the past and try to overcome our prejudgments and to be authentic with each other. With that wisdom in action, we can develop the healthy, edifying relationships that we need and that God wants for us. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, we give you thanks that you have illustrated for us the capacity and power of love. We pray, Lord, that as we follow Jesus, we might integrate that into our lives and build those relationships that are most important to us. Bless us, Lord, 
that we might be instruments of your blessing. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Things that you would like us to remember particularly in our prayers this morning. Yes. Traveling mercies for Daddy as she heads to New York uh, today. Um, it will be with our daughter having her knee surgery on Tuesday. So pray for a successful outcome of daughter Jeanette's knee surgery on Tuesday. Very good. Thank you so much, Jay. Yes. I'd like to hear the name. Laura. Laura. Thank you. Yes. I want to say prayers for my son because he's turning 51 on November the 12th. And also I'm over here when I have the holidays. I'm sorry, uh, his name again? I have the holidays. I said my son's turning 51 on November the 12th. Yes, I know his name. Happy Oh, John S. Martin. Thanks. Jalen. Thank you. I wish I were happy. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I just couldn't hear the name. Thank you. 
Then, let us take a moment for prayer. Lord of God, on this Reformation Sunday, we remember the heritage that we receive from faithful persons in generations past and our commitment to seek to be your faithful people in this day and in this time. We pray, Lord, that as we learn from their legacy, that we also might be persons who will bring honor to the name of Jesus in our time. Lord, we are confident that your spirit continues to be at work in and around and through us. And with that confidence, we raise before you our prayers. We pray, Lord, that Debbie's journey go well and that as Danette has her surgery this week, that you will guide the hands of the doctors and staff that they might provide complete and quick recovery. We pray, Lord, for Laura to recover from her lung surgery and that you will hold her in your care. We celebrate with John and Dilakus. Hold them in your care in the celebrations of this time and with their family. Lord, you continue to watch over and guide and be at work in and around and through us. And with that confidence, we raise before you the things that are on our hearts. It's not that you do not know them, but in our expressions, we give life to that relationship that expects to find you at work here. So, Lord, hear our prayers. Thank you. Continue to watch over and guide us as we follow your Son, Jesus, who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and join in singing our closing hymn. Please come over to the fellowship hall and join us for some refreshments. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in this and in every day. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.